Thank you, Dory. This is such a special evening, and we thank you all so much for being a part of it. I am joining you now live from Addis Israel Congregation in Washington, D.C., where I have the distinct honor of introducing an incredible conversation between Sarah Wildman and Judy Human. Sarah Wildman is the author of Paper Love, Searching for the Girl My Grandfather Left Behind. She is an editor and writer at New York Times Opinion and was previously an editor for NBC News Online and Foreign Policy Magazine, where she hosted and co-produced the podcast First Person. She's also been on staff at Vox and The New Republic. Sarah has received numerous fellowships and awards, including Pulitzer Center grants for covering issues shaping Jerusalem and Paris, among others. Judy Human is a lifelong advocate for the rights of disabled people. She has been instrumental in the development and implementation of legislation such as the Individuals with Disabilities Act, Edu Education Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Her memoir, Being Human, an unrepentant memoir of a disability rights activist, co-authored by Kristen Joyner, was published in 2020. She is also featured in the Oscar-nominated documentary, Crip Camp, A Disability Revolution. Judy produces a podcast called The Human Perspective, which features a variety of members from the disability community. Judy and Sarah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Judy, I cannot tell you what an honor it is. I swear I was like, will I be able to do this without <laughs> crying because you are such a gibora? I can't even begin to say how in awe, in awe I am of you. Thank you. Um, so I want to actually take us back a little bit to your childhood. Your parents were Holocaust survivors. Tell us a little bit about growing up with them in Brooklyn as a young child and how you felt there in Brooklyn. Well, I um, frequently say that if it weren't for Brooklyn, I wouldn't be the woman that I am. Uh, the saying, if you make it in New York, you make it anywhere. If you make it in Brooklyn, that's definitely true. Um, my parents, my mom was sent out when she was 12, and she was an only child. And she went to live with distant relatives that she didn't know. My father was 14, and he went to Brooklyn, and he knew some of the people that he was living with. So, you know, it was traumatic for both of them, obviously, but I think for my mother even more so because Literally at 12, she was whisked away onto a boat with someone that she didn't know to come to live in Chicago with someone she didn't know with an expectation that she would see her parents someday again. So I think my parents taught me resilience and um, taught me about how you don't know what's going to happen and you need to be strong and kind of prepared for anything. And so that I think really has allowed me as I, you know, moved through my life as a disabled person because I had polio in 1949 and they didn't know anything about disability. They were newly married and I was their first child and my mother was pregnant with my brother in her eighth month when I had polio. So, you know, they, they just, made a decision that they were going to raise me. Um, they like, were not advised to raise you, though, were they? That's right. When I, was, I found out when I was 36 years old that a doctor had recommended that my parents put me in an institution they when I was two. Um, and they didn't. And not only didn't they, but they must have like promised each other that they wouldn't tell me. Mm. So my dad told me when I was 36, I'm like, that's not true. He goes running up the stairs in the uh, house in Brooklyn saying, Ilsa, Ilsa, isn't this true? And she said, yes. But, you know, I think my story is particularly for that period of time is not really unusual. But still today, you know, we know that children with disabilities are, even though we have laws today that we didn't have then, parents really have to fight hard in many cases to make sure their kids are getting the education they need if they have disabilities. You didn't have that opportunity though right away, did you? When all your friends were going to school, what happened? Yeah, so our mom took me to school when I was five. Like, you know, Jewish education, um, parents' responsibility to make sure you go to school and you study, teacher's obligation to teach you. So my mother took me to school, but the principal 
said I couldn't go to the school because I was a fire hazard because I used a wheelchair. And so that really, I think, was the first time that my parents really were kind of struggling outside of their area of knowledge. And I didn't get to actually physically go to a school until I was nine. Um, the Board of Ed in New York sent a teacher uh, twice a week for a total of two and a half hours a week for first, second, third, and a half of the fourth grade. But my mother really, with the support of my dad, really did become a stronger and stronger advocate over the years. And as I was getting older, and it was becoming more age appropriate for me to be doing the advocacy, that transition naturally happened. You've said that you refused to accept what you were told you could be. Can you tell us what that means? Well, my parents raised me. My dad was a Marine, so it was kind of, there's no such thing as can't. Mm -hmm. And so, well, that's something that's abstract when you're younger. I think it's something that as I was getting older that I started to address. So obviously, uh, physical barriers which disabled people, physically disabled people may be facing, that isn't something that you can remedy quickly. Mm -hmm. But in the film Crip Camp, you know, you see um, disabled people and teenagers, where I think one of the values of the camp was that we were moving away from just complaining about the problems and beginning to think about solutions. You have not only been a part of, but a leader in several movements for radical change, for not just rights for disabled people, but also for how the world sees disabled people. Let's start with your lawsuit against the Board of Ed. What happened there? Um, when I applied to be a teacher, I passed the written and I passed the oral exams, both given in inaccessible buildings. And you also had to have a medical exam, which was given in an inaccessible building. My friends carried me up and down the stairs. But I had a doctor who was um, probably the most unusual doctor to ever give anyone a medical exam. But to summarize it, read the book if you want to learn more about it. But to summarize it, I was denied my license in writing uh, because of paralysis um, of both lower limbs, sequelae of poliomyelitis. So I then had to make a decision about what to do. But remember, my father was a butcher. Um, I was the oldest. We had no lawyers in our immediate surrounding. And one day, uh, the New York Times did a, an article on my being denied my license. It was a Wednesday. And the next day, the New York Times did an editorial supporting my getting the job. And then I got a call from a lawyer named Roy Lucas, who was writing a civil rights book, who actually was one of the attorneys arguing uh, in, to, to support uh, the overturning of the decision in Roe versus Wade so that women would have the right to choose. Um, he called and said, I don't know anything about disability and discrimination. I'm writing a book. Give me information, basically. And at the end of the interview, I really liked him. And so I said, would you represent me? And he said, yes. So this is the beginning of, and we unfortunately don't have the time to get into all of the ways in which you have changed disability rights, but you've actually said the civil rights movement had originally left out disabled people. Why was that, you think? Well, I think if you look at the Civil Rights Act of 64, um, it does not include disability, disabled people. And, you know, really, it's something that we continue to fight for, which is allowing people to understand that disabled people, we have the same rights. We must have the same rights and we must be respected equally like anyone else. But again and again, you were told, especially when fighting for Section 504, which I wish we could kind of explain a little bit, that they were going to offer separate but equal accommodations. What did that sound like to you? Well, again, if you look at Crib Camp, <laughs> you'll see that um, it clearly sounded wrong to all of us. And the demonstrations that took place um, pushing the Carter administration to sign the 504 regulations uh, were predicated on the fact that we, 
as disabled people wanted laws that would protect our rights um, to enable us to really gain access to education, to housing, to transportation, to employment, in order to be able to show people that we may do things differently, we may not do things differently, but at the end of the day, discriminating against us based on our disability is something that should not be permissible. I don't want us to miss the chance to talk about with Americans with Disabilities Act, but we are here tonight for Matan. And I want you to talk a little bit about the, why Matan matters to the Jewish community, what that inclusivity means, if, that, if you can. I mean, I think inclusivity is what it's all about. Um, it's critically important that disabled people and non-disabled people are coming together. And one of the um, important aspects of what I think has been going on in the Jewish community now for more than 10 years is a real commitment on the part of some to really look at what biases and prejudices have occurred within the Jewish community that have not allowed even Jews, disabled and non-disabled Jews, to feel respected and equal within our own community. So any opportunities where people can in fact, come together, learn about who we are, our likes, our dislikes, our objectives in life, and work cohesively. I think that's critically important. One of the things you said was that people tend to think equality is about treating everyone the same. Is, but it's not exactly that, is it? Well, in a certain way it is. You should treat everyone the same with respect. Now, what people may need in order to be able to enter a space may be different. So some, for some people, no sign language interpreter. For me, I don't need a sign language interpreter. But if you're deaf, you need a sign language interpreter in many cases. Captioning, various things like that. So it's, you know, it's looking at who we are and certain things like um, allergies to nuts. Mm -hmm. Clearly that is a disability because of the adverse effect that that could have. And people are seeing that these are changes that we have to make in order to ensure that people can enter a space. And that I think people accept in some ways more than if someone has a speech disability, an intellectual disability, a physical disability, mental health disability. We've been isolated and separated from each other for so long. And I also feel that the media has really not appropriately represented disability. Well, I want to thank you for chatting today, and I, I'm sorry that we don't have more time because I have so much I want to ask you about the necessity of visibility and why representation matters, but I know we actually have to present you. Meredith is going to be presenting you with an award, and I want to give her that chance to do that. Thank you so much for talking with me. I want to talk to you for, for an hour. But... I mean, I just want to say that everyone watching this needs to take a personal look at their lives and look at what they are doing or what they're not doing to advance the inclusion, in this case, of disabled people. But it's really a broader issue. It's inclusion of all in society. Thank you. Sarah and Judy, I have a feeling we will all be thinking about this conversation for a long time to come. Thank you so much to you both. When I co-founded Matan 22 years ago, it would have been beyond my wildest dreams to think that I would be standing here tonight presenting an award to Judy Human. Though she's receiving Matan's Impact Award, the word impact seems incredibly insufficient when considering all that Judy has accomplished and continues to achieve. Albert Einstein once said, the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, an almost fanatical love of justice, and the desire for personal independence, these are the features of the Jewish tradition which make me thank my stars that I belong to it. It is eminently clear that this is how Judy has lived her life, as a teacher, an advocate, a role model, and a mentor. She is powered by her Jewish roots, identity, and values, and we are so blessed that she is one of us. I don't think any of us would be here talking about Jewish disability inclusion without Judy's life's work. She is considered the mother of disability rights, and she has more than earned that distinction. Allowing us to honor you tonight is truly our greatest honor. It is my pleasure to present you with this Hamsa. 
Beautiful. Crafted especially for you by local DC artist, Ilana Mendelssohn. It includes all the colors of the rainbow as an overarching symbol that inclusion at its core is about diversity, equity, fairness, and justice. Everything you have fought for over your entire career. And as you know, a Hamsa is said to protect. And we hope that is what this will do hanging in your home. May you continue in your advocacy for many years to come in good health and surrounded by people who will join you and us in protecting the rights of every individual in our midst. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, I can hold it if you want, or you can hold it. And now we throw it back to New York City, where Tammy Reese, current Vice President of Matan's Board of Directors, will introduce our next honoree. 